Hello, my name is Taya Graham and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. As I always make clear, this show has a single purpose, holding the politically powerful institution of policing accountable. And to do so, we don't just focus on the bad behavior of individual cops. Instead, we examine the system that makes bad policing possible. And today, we will achieve that goal by showing how police retaliate against people that speak out against them. It is an update on the harassment endured by a previous guest whose illegal arrest garnered 3 million views. But since then, he has been subject to random stops by those same officers, which led to his jailing on false charges. It's an example of the aforementioned system run amok. But before we get started, I want you watching to know that if you have video evidence of police misconduct, please email it to us privately at par at therealnews.com and please like, share, and comment on our videos. You know I read your comments and that I appreciate them. And we do have a Patreon accountability reports pinned in the comments below. So if you feel inspired to donate, please do. We don't run ads or take corporate dollars. So anything you can spare is truly appreciated. All right, we've gotten that out of the way. Now, one of the reasons we always start this show by citing the so-called system that makes bad policing possible is due to what we have learned from reporting on it. What I mean is that our coverage of policing continues to reveal that the extraordinary powers we bestow on police extend well beyond the limits of a simple arrest. Case in point is the case I will be unpacking for you today. It involves a guest that we have had on the show before, but it's also an example of how standing up for your rights against law enforcement comes with a cost, which is sometimes very steep. That's because since we originally aired our piece on the illegal arrest of Daniel Alvarez, things have turned dicey, to say the least, for this Los Angeles County resident. In fact, since our last report, Daniel has said he's been pulled over at least half a dozen times for trivial issues like taillights and false DUI allegations, an ongoing process of harassment that he says is designed solely to intimidate him. Retaliation in the video we are showing you now and which we will explain in depth later. Now, as you might recall, in August of 2021, we reported on how Daniel was pulled over, now wait for it, for not stopping far enough back from a stop sign. I'm not kidding. But the officer uses that pretext to pull Daniel out of his car and put him in handcuffs. Let's watch. No, you didn't. What are you stopping me for? You're more than welcome to record. You've but seen me you at my house, get in the car, and then you turn around and chase me out. I didn't break any laws. Okay, but I'm telling you, you did. If I want to write you a ticket for that, we can I didn't. Report, I didn't stop it. over nothing. Okay. I stopped at the stop sign, turned to left. Huh? You have ID? Yeah, I have an ID. Okay, where's the idea? For what? What are you stopping me for? I'm stopping you for... Uh, no, you're stopping me because you've seen okay. what I look like. All right, don't reach for anything. You want my ID, right? But did I tell you to reach for it? You want my ID. It's what you're asking for, right? So now you, you can put your gun away. Okay, sit on the vehicle. That's annoying. You're stopping me because you want to see what I look like. Be a man and say what you're stopping me for then. I don't be did. petty. No, it's, it's Eddie, I didn't break no law. But what was really revealing about this arrest is how police behaved on camera when they thought no one was watching. That's because a phone belonging to Daniel's passenger was still recording while police searched his vehicle. And what they said showed just what Daniel's arrest was about. Take a listen. That guy. After we published the story, it went viral, garnering more than 3 million views. But the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and surrounding jurisdictions were not done with Daniel. Not hardly. Since then, they have continued to pull him over and harass him. Occasionally, these pretextual stops led to more false arrests, like this car stop when police actually accused Daniel of being drunk. I don't, I don't, I don't want to think I'm the hell if, if he's not. Yeah. But yeah, he has so enough what he's displaying, just based on my opinion, to take him to jail. Well, what are you saying? Be because the way he's acting. Yeah. You know what I mean? But you know, but he, but he is sober. I just want you to know, or think in, in, in your heart or your mind, he is. He is. Yeah, I don't, know what was up with, I don't know what was up with his driving, I, you know. But he just pulled out of my work. My work is right there by the bowling alley. That's okay. where I work. So they, he just had pulled out. So. I don't know, maybe he was hop, skipping and jumping to get home quick. I mean, I can't say why he was driving like that, but no. It we could have been, been that he was driving his phone. Honestly, it could have been that he was driving his phone and he started yelling. Maybe. Maybe. It could have been a lot of things, maybe. but I don't know that. Okay, okay. 
Now, even though Daniel had not been drinking, even though he passed all the field sobriety tests, police didn't care. In fact, they refused to give him a breathalyzer as he himself requested. Take a look. This encounter, one of eight separate incidents, led to Daniel spending over 48 hours in jail because he refused to pay a bail bondsman. And of course, when his blood test came back all negative, all the charges were dropped. But that's not the only video of a fraught encounter with Los Angeles County sheriffs that Daniel has had to endure since his video went viral. That's because just six months ago, Daniel was pulled over again, this time for a missing front license plate. But what happens during the stop is perhaps illustrative of Daniel's frustration with the never ending interactions with police. Take a look. Yeah. It's all on video camera though. Oh really? Yeah, the Why didn't search. they want to uh, let it go? What do you mean? They want to release it. Well, they don't release it right away like that. Well, what do you mean? Works. You got you to cover something? That's right. I have a lawyer that's in the process of dealing it. with it. Oh, really? Yeah. That's, that's bullshit. Don't even talk about it. Like what everybody you thinks. Gotta, you you pace me. When, you no, 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 no. Look, California law off. doesn't doesn't uh, hold up with pace. Cut, yeah, you, that, that's what I'm telling you. You cut someone off to jump right behind me okay. because he well, already has. Argue, you no, he already you has. Have a we're gonna do this again. You couldn't have seen thing. that. So that second day, you, came you are, Yeah, but you already know that. I don't do anything. So we're gonna do this whole thing again. What's the easiest way out of this? This situation. Okay. You probably, With you. Okay. You right. So what is the easiest way for us to I just got, let, let you guys be happy and get on our way? I got some shorts on so that'll kind of pick yeah, up. So what do we need to do? I'm asking you, you to sergeant, right? Typically what do you do? No. Yeah. Just yeah. identify themselves, make sure they have a valid okay. license. Okay. Show them your license no, and we can be on our way. Yeah. And yeah. here's my registration and all that, sir. So California law isn't, you can't pay somebody. It won't stick up in court. That's my mom right there. You should remember her car, right? Huh? That's your car. You remember it? That's the car that you stopped. Oh, that you were driving. Yeah. What's yours? Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying, okay? You can run it right here. I ain't got no wants, no wants. But but what even argue it for? We'll put this up, buddy. You just we just passed you guys. I mean, come on, we're not stupid. We've been around a while. You've been around a while, right? You stop us because you see what we look like. Three guys in a car. Let's stop them. So First how can you pay him? Yeah, I rolled it. It was wrong there, Davenport. There's multiple things you're that saying, you saying. Okay. You know the license plate, you're right, safety, because we moved a truck and it fell off, so it's actually in the back seat. It's oh, okay. cowardice. It's cowardice. Yeah. Public safety is heroism. Okay. Like I told you last oh. time, bro. Like it's for you. last time you were a dick. Contrary to what you say, nothing's personal. Last time you were a dick. You came. You came with a gun. You came with a gun. Oh come on. I just you're just so full of shit. Even when I tried to be cool with you and said, okay, here, I'm not doing nothing, you still were a dick. All the way to the end, you were a dick. I said, if you're not. Yeah. I'm sure you did. No matter how many times you stop me, you'll never catch me doing anything because I don't do anything. I'm not about anything. You'll end up getting tired of fucking with me. Waste your time. Time you you waste okay. your time with me while everybody else is running around doing that? something else. Just like I would oh, no, be arrested if I was. In I didn't even see you. I would have put my window up. With <laughs> being a robbery. I get that, okay. but my interaction okay. with you last time. So I actually, you can look me up like on uh, Facebook. So like I do a lot of stuff back with the community, right? Doesn't matter what I've ever done in my past, but I do a lot of stuff with the community with like RX Paris. So you can you can look and you can search me at any time and anything. We don't do anything illegal, all right? You, we may look the part. Let's search them. And most of the time, I don't trip. It's just the point of, of the approach, right? And I, and I tried it's, to tell you last time, like, hey, bro, this is why my approach was like you. No, oh, okay. yes. but, but last time, I seen you guys at so the light going that way. And you guys you're flipped at the light. It says you're... What? So I get it, right? I, I'm, I'm not dumb. I see somebody... Let's check them. I get it, but... At what point? Now it is worth noting that even though Daniel had not done anything illegal, the officer wrote him several tickets, citations that he added to an expansive collection of traffic fines Daniel has shared with us, which we are showing you on the screen now. And to find out how this never ending series of engagements with cops in LA have affected his life, his livelihood, and his overall state of mind, I will be talking with Daniel shortly. But first, 
I'm joined by my reporting partner, Stephen Janis, who's been looking into the case and reaching out to police. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Now, Stephen, you've been reaching out to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department at Lancaster Station for comment. What have they told you? Well, a big bunch of nothing because they don't really answer their calls. We've had some pretty interesting uh, phone chains where we tried to call people. They picked up the phone and they kind of go mute when they realize it's a reporter on the end of the line. So, you know, it's been no, not fruitful, but obviously we've had an impact and we'll talk about that later. So Daniel has filed several complaints and you have followed up with those. What have you learned? Well, what I've learned is that it's a system that's meant to not respond to complaints. It's a system that's meant to obfuscate. It's a system that doesn't have a lot of transparency. I mean, there's no real online process for how these complaints are processed or what's really due to the person who has filed them. We have put in a lot of calls with a lot of different commanders who are in these units and would not heard back, but we will continue to follow up on that. Now, someone has actually reached out to us about our reporting and perhaps helping Daniel but it wasn't law enforcement per se. Can you talk about it? Yeah, I'll tell you, so what happened is that the Los Angeles County Public Defender's Office, their police accountability unit reached out to us and they didn't just reach out to us to ask us for information. They specifically wanted the video we just did. Just wait of a second. You're saying that the Los Angeles Public Defender's Office wants to use our reporting to help discredit corrupt cops in court? Yeah, that's right. Actually, yes, that is right. The Los Angeles County Public Defender's Office Police Accountability Unit wants our video to actually show in court to actually help discredit police officers who have lied in the past in cases similar to Daniel. So it's really a big sign of what independent journalism can do. I think it's a significant for this unit to be using our material and our reporting. It shows why our reporting is important, why follow-up is important, why it's important to tell stories like Daniel, and why it's just important to have this kind of videos, these kind of videos online where people can access them and not part of the mainstream media, whatever. Wow. Stephen, if that's not an example of us helping to hold police accountable, I don't know what is. But now, to get more on what is being done to help people facing corrupt cops in Los Angeles and how this has affected his life, I'm joined by the man whose arrest started this chain of events, Daniel Alvarez. Daniel, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So Daniel, how did this DUI traffic stop begin? A retaliation situation from the first one. Um, after the first video had happened, uh, basically, all of the all of those guys that were associated with uh, that same sheriff, uh, Terrace Hanner, they would come by my house. They like they already knew my vehicles. They knew what I looked like. So anytime they seen me, they would all just come pull me over. That day, I was at my mom's work, and I and I left her when I was leaving her work. I noticed there was like like probably like three or four cars sitting across the street, and I thought that's weird. What are they doing? You know, there's not even nothing right there. I got in my car, I went to pull out. As soon as I pulled out, they all took off behind me and turned their lights on. So I'm like, oh, oh it makes sense now. They're waiting for me, right? So I kind of drove a little bit. I didn't. I, I kind of slowed down, but I drove to a store, like by a store where I felt like there's cameras, there's people. Um, I knew, I said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive down here where there's more people um, and I'm going to stop right there, right? So... I, I went slow. I, you know, I made sure that they didn't think that I was running from them. And I drove right, just, just very short distance to this gas station. I pulled into the gas station, uh, put the car in park. You know, I always try to get uh, my camera right away. But this time they came super aggressive, guns out pointed at me. So I wasn't going to reach down, right? I'm like, no way. They came up to the car right away, called my name, get out of the car. I said, oh, you already know my name. I recognized like four of them from the other stops. So I said, oh, you guys, you guys are mad because I made a complaint on your buddy, right? So I get it, right? I know what you guys are doing. They just, you know, all these excuses, uh, pulled me out with a gun, you know, handcuffed me, put me in the uh, car. But somebody driving by had recognized my car. So they called my sister. Hey, your brother's straight here. A bunch of cops got your brother. So my sister comes over there. Um. By that time, there's already probably maybe like 10 or 12 of them there. Uh, so they searched my car, you know, all this whole thing. Uh, he says, well, I think you're drunk. And I said, oh, okay, you know, all right, all right we can do whatever, whatever you want to do. Wait, did the officer give you a breathalyzer or blood test so you could prove your sobriety? So we did a whole bunch of tests, maybe for like a half an hour, probably. They had me do tests. 
I kept passing him because, you know, I wasn't under, under the influence. And he said, all right, well, I think that you're under the influence of drugs. And I said, OK. So he said, I'm going to take you to jail, impound your car. Um, I said, all right, you know, I, I get what they're doing. So he he wouldn't do the breathalyzer because he knew that I basically passed all the tests for the alcohol. So that's when he said, I think you're under the influence of drugs. So I said, OK, take me straight to the jail. And then I said, also, at what point do we, you know, do any kind of tests or anything? And he was like, oh, no tests, no tests. So I had called my sister when I got the phone call and I said, hey, they brought me to jail. They, you know, they didn't. so then they pulled me out of the cell, took me to the hospital to go have blood drawn. So I, at first I said, no, I don't want to do the blood thing. Right. And they were like, oh, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to force you to do it. I said, all right, whatever. Right. Took the blood. I stayed in jail. I think like. I could have bailed myself out or my sister would have bailed me out, but I was just like, not, you know, it was Friday night. I figured I'm going to be stubborn too. So <laughs> I stayed in there, I think till Sunday morning, Monday morning, I got out. I got out at like three o'clock Monday morning and I went straight to work. I have to admit, I admire your stubbornness for refusing to pay bail. I think their lack of evidence helps support your assertion that you are being harassed for speaking out and filing complaints. They're like the street gang that you have to worry about, right? There's like nobody else causing chaos but them. There's a video of that actual stop on my YouTube from when my sister was recording. And when I brought up to the sergeant that came, I said, you know, four of these guys were at the first traffic stop over there. And he told those guys, hey, you guys, get out of here. Leave, hurry quick. And I told him, why are you telling those four to leave? But you're not telling anybody else. You're only doing that after I told you um, that they were at the first two stops. And he told them, hurry up, leave. And I said, oh, that right there tells me that you are, know exactly what's going on. Why do you believe you were stopped? I mean, do you think this was retaliation? Absolutely. All the times that I've been stopped, definitely from the situation with Tara Sander, have all been retaliation because of the process that I went through was the formal complaint process. And since I did that, I believe that they're not used to people doing that, right? They don't think that anybody knows to do that. And a lot of people don't know to follow that process. And I was educated by somebody that here, let's go through this process. This is the way that you should do it. And it got attention from other people that affected them. So they thought in their mind, let's put pressure on this guy. And then he'll just fold and won't complain no more. But all the times that they did it, I just did the same thing. I try to always record them. And then I go and I, and I let the same process play out. And I think that that has, you know, we've it's been back and forth because they come push and think I'm going to fold. And I just do the same thing. Now, since we last reported on you, thousands of people commented on your video concerned about your last encounter with L.A. County Police. And now a public defender's office is looking into police misconduct cases, and they have reached out to you because your rights were violated. What have they said to you? Um, he just kind of asked me for some information. I think that he's limited to what he can do or, or any information that he can give. He can give what's public record, right, which is what any of us can go obtain. But um, he just asked me, like, uh, what happened, why I was originally stopped. And then he asked me, you know, about everything that's happened since then. I think there's been uh, roughly like eight encounters since then. And I have followed the same process with all eight of them, which is try to film them always, file the complaint, follow it all the way through. Um, so I just shared that information with him. I think it, it happens all too often, right? They, they put... This is their thing that I always deal with, right? They they pull me over, and then when I ask them, okay, what'd you pull me over for? Uh, we pulled you over for not using a blinker, but they come up to you with a gun drawn, um, you know, a gun in your face, and it's basically like, why do you have a gun in my face for not using a blinker? Do you stop everybody like this? And their thing is, is yes, we stop everybody like this. So it's the same thing, right? Got in the face, drag you out of the car, handcuff you, uh, back to the police car, super tight handcuffs for an hour. They never find anything. They're angry. You put a little pressure on them. They try to put pressure on you and then they leave looking like fools, right? And then you follow the process of the complaint. Everybody kind of sees what they're doing and it kind of affects them in a different way, right? Because a different set of eyes are watching them. And, and, and I'm sure they do it all the time and get away with it because not a lot of people want to go through the process of the complaint or know how to do it or you know they just kind of rather be left alone and i understand you know because they they come back in force okay so they pulled you over on eight 
separate occasions. It's been roughly eight separate okay. occasions. I have all the uh, documents of the places, times. Um, they usually always write some tickets because they have to show, you know, that they're in charge. The tickets will always be dismissed. Um, this last, the last two that happened were with a sergeant. As soon as I passed through the light, they were both staring at me, all, you know, like as I went by. But, you know, I didn't, no big deal, right? I didn't do nothing. He literally runs the red light, turns around in the middle of traffic, chases me down. So I pull over and I'm going to get my phone. The same thing, right? He's already out of the car running up with a gun. So I said, okay, I'm not going to reach for nothing because, you know, this guy, is, he's already on one. Pulls me out of the car, um, handcuffs me, puts me in the back of his car, searches my mom's car. We're there for maybe an hour. Daniel, I honestly feel bad asking, but do you think because your video had so many views that it embarrassed the department and maybe it contributed to your harassment? Yeah, but you know what? I think it's great, right? Because it's like they, this happens literally so many times a day and it just goes, it's just normal, right? I see people all the time and they're like, oh, I just got pulled over. This guy shoved a gun in my face, searched my car, treated me like trash, had me in handcuffs in the back of a car, said because I didn't use a blinker. Well, really? Like, because you didn't use a blinker? And, you know, that's their excuse. You didn't use a blinker. You made an unsafe lane change, didn't have insurance with you or some stupid, right? And But it, it doesn't get no attention. So there's no repercussion. They can just keep doing it, doing it, doing it. That video just so happened that I told her, hey, hey, start recording because here he comes, right? And she was quick with her phone. She was like, two buttons, bam, fast. And you got, you seen what happened just based on her recording of what they did to her. Like, you know, we're going to, we're going to assault you because you, you know, you are recording us. The public defender's office that reached out to you says that it is very common for these officers to violate constitutional rights. How are they going to help you and others who've experienced police misconduct? You know, we talked a little bit and um, we were supposed to uh, talk some more. I haven't had a chance to get back to him, but, you know, it's 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 crazy because after the very first incident, I've had like three or four lawyers call me and ask me about the situation and about uh, specific um sheriffs and if i knew them and if i ever had encounters with them and i always direct them to my youtube page yeah there's some videos on there with those guys you know if you know them you can put their name to their face and they all say the same thing right all oh, these guys pulled this guy over for no blinker same same exact almost situation you know and and i'm like oh yeah that, that I, I believe that 100 percent because i seen how you know i see how they act Definitely believe it's true. How much has this cost you personally, either financially in tickets or legal fees, or just even in stress and emotional costs? Absolutely. It's a stressful factor, right? In the beginning, um, I would have these situations with them, the encounters, you know, and then it's a super negative encounter already. And But I try to never let it, like, leave that situation and keep me negative, right? Because just because... Just because they're terrible people doesn't mean that I have to be a terrible person too, right? So I try to stand my ground to a safe distance. In the beginning, I made a mistake by um, paying some tickets that were bogus, right? They were absolutely bogus. I knew they were bogus. He knew they were bogus. I didn't want to miss work. And I just, I made the decision, you know what? I'm just going to pay them, right? I paid them. And then after I paid them, you know, I was, I think like $800 in tickets. Uh, not, a, not a whole lot, but, you know, $800, right? And then after the fact, some people had given me some input, feedback, and, you know, why would you pay for something that you knew that was bogus? And I had to really think about it, right? And, and there was a couple of reasons why I paid it. I didn't want to miss work. I didn't really care about the money, but I was just like, I'm just going to pay it. But I did make the decision after that that, you know what? The questions that I was being asked, you know, you're absolutely right. And, I, and I'm not going to pay for something that's not, uh, that's, that's fake, that's false, right? Like, um, you're going to pull me over, you're going to lie, and then you're going to charge me money based on your lie. Like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to go and I'm going to show the facts and I'm going to, because if they're doing it to me, how many other people are they doing it to, right? Now, if there is one thing that Daniel's story reminds me of, it's an essential right we often take for granted, but in some respects is our most important. It's a right not specifically enumerated in the Constitution, but does permeate conceptually throughout it. Put simply, I'm talking about the right to dissent. More specifically, the right to disagree with, push back, and otherwise challenge power. It is a right so important and so essential to maintaining our other freedoms that I don't think this country could function without it 
if indeed we think of our country as functional, but that's a whole other topic. I mean, if you truly examine the work of people known as cop watchers, for example, the videos and the antics all sort of boils down to a massive affirmation of the right to dissent. The people who film police at traffic stops and post on YouTube are, in one sense, journalists, but on the other hand, activists committed to the fundamental idea of rational and sometimes irrational protracted disagreement or dissent. And the reason I bring this idea up in part is because of the story we just discussed, not necessarily to rehash the continued harassment of Daniel or his series of questionable arrests. No, what I wanna focus on is why our ability to push back is so important through the lens of what Daniel experienced and how his case shows that we simply underutilize and misapprehend the true power of simply disagreeing with power. Let's remember that your average citizen does not have the ability to issue a subpoena, put someone in handcuffs, fine them, confiscate a driver's license, or otherwise compel someone to do anything other than listen. We can't seize people's property or break into their homes or get cell phone records or sift through the private information of any person or entity that piques our interest. But we're not without power because what we can do to ensure the formidable power of government does not overwhelm us is to never, and I mean never, lose the right to tell our version of the story, to never forgo the ability to dissent by changing the way the tale is told. In other words, I think we have to narrate and explicate our own stories of dissent. I think we must shape and preserve the counter narratives to the pronouncements of the elite that all forms of activism are just obstructing the inevitable. To get a sense of what I mean, consider this story about one of our favorite topics on the show, copaganda, or the media's obsession with reporting from the sole perspective of law enforcement. Published by The Nation, the article starts by noting the 2020 release of crime statistics by the FBI and how national media outlets use the spike in homicides to discredit hard-won criminal justice reform. The piece concluded this effort to link reform to a crime spike is part of a larger trend, and I quote, a pro-police worldview deeply ingrained in journalism. The author goes on to argue that while there is no evidence tying a more just system with violence, major media outlets take every fluctuation in crime to make that same tenuous connection. And this narrative they create only leads to more police spending and less emphasis on the social services that might actually do more to prevent crime than the mainstream media might like to admit. Which is why I think the reaction to Daniel's story is so illustrative of how important it is to discuss who writes the narrative for us. That's because police can target people like him if they own the narrative about him, so long as his perspective remains absent. Meaning, by constantly reinforcing the notion that the streets are inexplicably awash in blood and that only the police can clean it up, they are left with almost unlimited discretion on how to go about it, which is why the lazy, abusive, and yes, unconstitutional tactics used to arrest and harass Daniel are possible. Simply put, the law enforcement industrial complex makes us believe there is no other alternative but them, and that the working class is subject to an any means necessary process. I mean, why else would police target Daniel over and over again? Why else would they try to arrest and discredit him and make his life miserable if not to punish and prevent him from telling his own story? What could possibly motivate them other than the fact that Daniel got in front of the camera, exposed police corruption, and showed three million viewers the injustices perpetrated upon him? That's the alarming message from Daniel's travails with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. We tell your story, not you. So today, we are gonna add to Daniel's push for transparency and join him in holding the officers in question accountable. We are going to do our part, not just to tell his story, but to ensure that the harassment of Daniel stops now. To do so, we are going to read the names of the deputy sheriffs that the public defender provided to us who were involved or participated in Daniel's arrest. Incidentally, the primary sheriff who pulled him over, Daniel Tanner, has been reassigned to the county jail. Here are the rest of the officers who were involved. Adam Zico, 
badge number 482241. David Jenkins, badge number 615102. Juan Montes de Oca, badge number 616066. Travis Lang, badge number 616067. And Daniel Aguilar, badge number 622118. And let me say this, I am not accusing these officers of wrongdoing, but I am putting you on notice. We are watching. My audience is watching. So please, just leave Daniel alone. I want to thank my guest Daniel Alvarez for joining me today, for speaking with us, and for coming forward. Thank you, Daniel. And of course, I want to thank intrepid reporter Stephen Janis for his writing, research, and editing on this piece. Thank you, Stephen. And I want to thank friends of the show, Noli D and Lacey R for their support. Thank you. And a very special thanks to our patrons. We appreciate you. And I look forward to thanking each and every one of you personally in our next live stream, especially Patreon associate producers, John R and David K and super friends, Shane Bushta, Pineapple Girl, and Chris R. And I want you watching to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate for you. Please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at par at therealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. And of course, you can always message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter or Facebook. And please like and comment. I do read your comments and appreciate them. And even if I don't always answer each one, I assure you, I read it. And we do have a Patreon link for accountability reports pinned in the comments below. So if you feel inspired to donate, please do. We don't take corporate dollars or run ads. So anything you can spare is truly appreciated. My name is Taya Graham, and I am your host of the Police Accountability Report. Please be safe out there. <laughs>